stabilization at Sorbonne Université Paris, where his responsibilities include the teaching of courses on the history of ideas. He regularly gives seminars on the links between mystical literature of the Flemish and German traditions and pictorial art at the Center for Renaissance Studies. His publications include contributions to the study of Hedwich of Brabant, Ruiz Brock, the Admirable, and regarding Nicholas of Cusa's theological geometry, and L.E.J. Brewer's intuitionism. He's the co-editor of Mathematics and the Divine, and co-organized the conference on the exchanges between the Vienna Circle and Dutch significance and intuitionism, the proceedings of which are forthcoming. So put our hands together to welcome Dr. Luc Bergman, please. So, <clears throat> ladies and gentlemen, and dear colleagues and friends, I would first uh, like to uh, thank the organizers of this uh, conference for their very kind invitation and uh, the generous way in which we are, we are being received here. Um, let me just see. So, the uh, title of my conference is. Uh, uh, of my talk has changed a little bit. Uh, I added the word uh, significs, right? mathematics and ultimate reality in intuitionism, significs and uh, neo-Kantianism. So my aim is the following. Um, uh, I'm an historian, I consider myself to be an historian of ideas. And uh, when I did my studies in uh, the Netherlands, uh, I met a close associate uh, of uh, Luits and Egbertus Jan Brouwer and got uh, a lot of inf interesting information about his life and, and thought. And, uh, this close associate was uh, Professor uh, de Jong, who is not very well known because, not very well known because he uh, has, uh, didn't write very much. He was a, also a direhard Platonist and believed one shouldn't write too much. So, so um, in recent years, in the last 20 years, there have been lots of studies uh, about uh, uh, life uh, and uh, uh, opinions and uh, philo philosophical positions of uh, Brouwer. Uh, the, f the founder, the father of Dutch intuitionism. And among these uh, main contributions, I would like to mention those by uh, Dirk van Dalen, who is considered to be the, uh, I mean, uh, the, the main biographer, as well as uh, Mark uh, van Atten, and uh, a younger research fellow, uh, who has written uh, on, on Brouwer. So when we read uh, publications uh, like uh, those, uh, what strikes me is that uh, certain aspects uh, of um, uh, Brouwer's contacts have been neglected, uh, certain aspects of his intellectual friendships with uh, various people in the Netherlands, 
Uh, and I think uh, like exploring these uh, contacts is important to find out more about uh, the connection between uh, Brouwer's vision on uh, mathematics uh, in relationship uh, with uh, uh, mysticism, uh, religion, and the, the, the subject that we are particularly interested in uh, today. <coughs> this is uh, uh, Brouwer's soulmate, uh, uh, Frederik van Ede. Frederik van Ede is one of the more uh, original uh, characters of the Dutch uh, fin de siècle. Uh, he was uh, a poet. He considered himself to be, first of all, a poet, but he was also a medical doctor, a psychiatrist, and a social reformer. Uh, and he is considered to be uh, the father of another uh, uh, trend another current of ideas in the Netherlands uh, called uh, Signifix, uh, about which I would like to tell you a little bit more, because uh, Brouwer too was a member of the uh, Signific group. But first, Frederik van Ede. Uh, he is mainly known uh, in the Netherlands as, as the author of an autobiographical uh, novel, The Kleine Johannes, or Little John, Little uh, Johannes, uh, where he uh, tells how, as, how he grows up as, as a child. It's written like a, a kind of a fairy tale. If anybody in the Netherlands now knows uh, Frederik van Ede, it's usually uh, through the clan Johannes. He wrote that book uh, in the 1880s, which uh, is an important period in, the, uh, in Dutch literature. Uh, it's the generation of the years, which is the 1880s, and characterized by the presence of uh, poets uh, who um, exalted poetry and poets and saw themselves as gods. And in, in deep in their themselves, they felt uh, like gods. Uh, and that too uh, is, is something which really influenced uh, Frederik van Eten. He is also the author of uh, Het Lied van Schijn en Wezen, or uh, The Song of uh, Appearance and uh, Essence. Uh, he wrote uh, this book over several years, and it is like a long uh, poem uh, in which he uh, describes uh, the uh, development of his uh, convictions uh, regarding uh, the world, regarding uh, religion. And so uh, we can. Uh, by reading that book, uh, see how everything evolves. Uh, in the beginning, he was, uh, he was right from the start a, a uh, religious person, like very much uh, interested in religion, but he didn't like uh, the structures of a, of a church. Um, he felt that nature was also uh, one of the best ways of getting in getting into touch with uh, the absolute. Uh, later, I'm now talking about the 1920s, he converted to uh, Catholicism. And uh, we can also see that uh, the last part of the song uh, of uh, appearance and essence uh, basically uh, retells uh, the, the dogmas of the Catholic Church, but uh, in, in the form of a poem. And then another uh, important work by Frederik van Ede, uh, which was also uh, read by uh, Brouwer, is Redekunstige uh, Grondslag van Verstandhouding, or um, Rhetorical uh, Foundation of Understanding. This book is considered to be the first uh, systematic presentation of Dutch significance. Significs uh, is like a, a new uh, science uh, of uh, communication which he wanted to develop with his friends. There were uh, other um, similar uh, trends. We know, for instance, that Frederik van Ede uh, uh, was in touch with Lady Victoria Welby, uh, who uh, in England also developed a type of significs. Uh, and the Dutch word uh, significa, which uh, van Eden uses, uh, is uh, certainly uh, derived uh, from uh, significance uh, as perceived by uh, Lady Victoria Welby. 
The motivation behind uh, uh, the development of a new science of uh, the sign of our communication was that uh, Frederick van Ede and his friends, and among his friends, uh, Brouwer, there was the feeling that, well, people did not uh, communicate well. There was a lot of uh, confusion. So the idea was to uh, clarify uh, language. Uh, also, in particular, uh, for people like Brouwer and his um, mathematical colleague, Gerrit Manouri, uh, the, the language of mathematics. Uh, for Lady Victoria Welby, and uh, also for Frederick van Ede, who was uh, a poet, it was also about clarifying uh, uh, the language of poetry or uh, getting better insight in the way a poet uh, uses the language. And in fact, uh, this um, uh, treatise, Rede Kunstige Grondslag van Verstandhouding, uh, uh, which is usually translated as logical foundation of uh, understanding, and I think it's not the way it should be translated, because if it had been logical, uh, what he meant, then he would have used the Dutch word for logical, which he didn't. He used the word rede kunst, which is closer to uh, rhetorical. So what he's trying to do in uh, uh, that book is um, um, showing the different ways in which language is used, showing how the poet uses language, showing how people in daily life use the language, show how uh, uh, science and uh, scientists, how mathematicians use language, and then see the connection, see the connection between all these different ways of using the language. A um, significant circle was founded, and Brouwer was part of that circle. So you see, uh, and it's an important link, and I would now like to focus on one aspect um, of uh, significance, uh, which is a, a pattern, like a scheme which they, they developed uh, and which um, illustrates what they see as the polar structure of the mind. This brings us right back to our uh, subject because uh, the feeling of uh, Frederick van Ede, uh, Brouwer and uh, Manouri was uh, that uh, indeed the human mind has a polar structure, there is a tendency towards objectification and uh, as to language, as to use a precise language where each word is used in a very symbolic way. But there is also uh, the opposite tendency, uh, which, is, uh, which opens up uh, the, uh, the mind and which, is, uh, um, which widens also the, uh, the, the semantics of, of words, also the way words are used and uh, which uh, is better uh, adapted to um, uh, religious speaking uh, or uh, the, the way uh, mystics use uh, the language. And their idea is that uh, it is really a, uh, a polar structure, which means one cannot ever get rid of the other pole. You can uh, make an effort to get as close as possible to perfect ob objectification. Or, or you do the opposite, but you will never be completely successful. It's about real poles. Um, Van Ede and his friends were, were very um, idealistic, and the, the idea uh, of uh, significance is uh, mentioned in uh, a sequel to The Kleine Johannes, uh, where, um, I, th I think you, I'll let you read this, um, uh, one of the characters says, we, just like we developed a science of, uh, of measure, uh, and just as we developed a science of the stars, astronomy, uh, we now need a new, a precise chance, uh, uh, excuse me, a precise science uh, which studies uh, the use of uh, meaning. And if we do that, and if we manage to um, uh, mobilize lots of people all over the world uh, because it was really the idea of a, a universal way of understanding and uh, we, we uh, will manage to, to find a uh, or to create a better world uh, where there will be brotherhood uh, among men uh, so a very idealist, idealistic view 
of the purification of language, language as a means uh, to uh, uh, perfect the world. Another um, uh, work written by Gerrit Manori, so he was a mathematician, is uh, Mathesis and Mystique. Uh, so obviously lots of these uh, publications were written in Dutch. Some of them uh, have been translated into English, uh, others not. This rather small booklet, uh, Mathesis and the Mystique, made uh, uh, mathematics and mysticism, made Manori uh, well known in the Netherlands. Uh, it was later translated into French as Les Deux Pôles de l'Esprit, uh, which means exactly uh, uh, the, the two poles of, of the mind, uh, with the same idea, uh, the mystical pole and the mathematical pole. Um, the uh, Signific Circle, and, and, and Brouwer was a part uh, of them, uh, developed uh, several publications, like they met regularly, um, and uh, they developed different proposals for what they called um, gradation, uh, like a scheme in which uh, all the different types of languages or uses of the language are uh, compared in a, and put together in a hierarchical way. Uh, I'll, t I'll take the, uh, the version of 1919, to, to which Brabham also contributed. And in, in this uh, uh, publication, uh, they, they talk about taal gradatie. Taal in Dutch means language. Gradatie is clear, language gradation. They start from a basic language. And basic language comprises, for instance, uh, the way uh, children use the language. Uh, or, or also uh, uh, the, the expression of uh, pain, eh, of, of very uh, deeply felt uh, pain or, or joy. Huh? Uh, in, in some cases also they, they relate it to uh, the, the origin of language and uh, they think that maybe it might be uh, the, the first use of, of language. Okay, then we go to B, which is the emotive language, which means that there is already uh, some structure to, to it, but uh, with still a very close link uh, with um, emotion and volition. Uh, both are always very present in uh, significant uh, literature. Uh, so the, uh, the workings of the will as well as uh, emotion. Then there is utility uh, language, which is uh, basically the way um, uh, language can be used in daily life. Uh, there is more, much more structure to it. Emotion still plays a role, uh, but one detaches oneself from emotion. Then there is uh, the scientific language, where things become more and more abstract and the language uh, much more uh, regular in every respect. And then uh, finally there is the uh, symbolic uh, lang language. And uh, this comprises then uh, um, what they call passigraphic uh, mathematics, uh, like uh, axiomatic uh, language, formal language, any type of formal language. Okay, it's a hierarchy which uh, means uh, that uh, the, the, the origin, let's say, or the base is considered to be the, well, the basic language, as the word uh, says. And uh, as one moves away from the basic language, uh, um, the, the structure becomes more strict and, and regulated and there, there is less and less uh, of a link with emotion and volition. Okay, so this, this was their idea. Now, um, Brouwer shows himself a real uh, signification and, uh, okay, because I have to limit myself uh, to, uh, I can't, you know, tell everything what I want to say about uh, Brouwer, but let's have a look at what I call the self-centered judgment on truth in mathematics. And we can see that Brouwer uh, acts like a signification. I quote, quote a small uh, passage from uh, Brouwer's Cambridge lectures on, on uh, intuitionism. And that's a, pas a passage where uh, we can see what has been mentioned several times before uh, this morning, like the idea of uh, the excluded third. Uh, 
it's a very complex uh, problem, uh, and I also realize that um, there has been a lot of criticism. I mean, we can also discuss this. But anyway, uh, this is what Brouwer says. Only after mathematics uh, had been recognized as an uh, autonomous interior constructional activity, the criterion of truth and falsehood of a mathematical assertion was uh, confined to mathematical activity itself without appeal to logic or to hypothetical omniscient beings. An immediate consequence was that for a mathematical assertion, A, the two uh, cases of truth and falsehood, formally exclusively admitted, were replaced by the following three. So he then distinguishes uh, A has been proven to be true, a has been proven to be false or absurd. A has neither been proven to be true nor to be absurd, nor do we know a, a finite algorithm uh, leading to the statement either that A is true or that A is absurd. That is a crucial passage. In an earlier uh, publication, and I'm now thinking of uh, Brouwer's uh, doctorate, uh, um, over the grondslagen van de wiskunde, meaning uh, on the foundations of uh, mathematics, uh, we see uh, what is behind uh, the, uh, the idea of uh, these uh, three options, uh, namely a freely uh, creating uh, subject. Uh, this is one of the basic notions uh, of uh, Brouwer. Now, if we... Uh, just take again the, the, a, the three notions that we just mentioned, or excuse me, the three options that we just mentioned, uh, we see that what um, Brouwer does is in fact some kind of a significant exercise. Because what he does is uh, uh, criticizing uh, traditional logic uh, which distinguishes between uh, true and false. And he does so by um, uh, making clear uh, that there is a subject uh, behind these decisions. There is a subject with, which is also described as having a will. Uh, it's a willing subject, um, and um, which is here referred to, uh, especially in uh, the, uh, the third point, uh, where uh, there is a question of not knowing. Not, so I will go in to develop this a little bit more. Uh, what I'm trying to say is, in fact, that uh, he, he, Brouwer uses the uh, gradation and he analyzes a formal language going back to uh, a more basic type of language, namely uh, emotive language. Because according to him, there are like two aspects to mathematics. There is the formalized mathematics, but there is also a much more fundamental uh, use of, of language, which is not uh, uh, formal. Um, coming back to uh, uh, Johan de Jong, so his uh, close associate, he once told me that uh, in Brouwer's opinion, the, the most uh, authentic use of um, lang uh, ma mathematical language had to be compared to the sounds uh, people uh, make when they, um, uh, for instance, uh, are forging uh, iron or are doing rhythmic um, uh, labor. And the, the sounds that are then uttered, like hey, he, ho, or uh, to, to hoist uh, a weight or to, to beat the iron, uh, sounds which uh, regulate the, the, the will of the different participants, and, uh, that comes cl the closest to counting. So at the origin, there is not like the concept of number, but there is the, the volitional use of, of language. Okay, another aspect of uh, Brouwer uh, uh, in his uh, early writings is his um, frequent uh, reference to the self. Um, now, the self 
uh, of course, should be associated uh, with what we said about the freely uh, creating mathematician. But uh, it's, of course, a very um, a complex uh, problem, which was also dealt with by Frederick van Ede in the rhetorical foundation of significance, of, of, of understanding. Um, because, okay, there's the use of the word I, there is the, the individual person, and then there is the self. And obviously, because, the, because of the use of the word self, these two are related. Uh, but uh, the self is, a, is not even a real concept. Uh, it re it uh, refers to something much deeper. And th that doesn't allow to be uh, completely conceptualized. And among philosophers, uh, the self uh, is sometimes described as a uh, Grenzbegriff in uh, German, which uh, could be translated, uh, translated as a limit-setting concept. Frederick van Eden too was uh, very uh, interested in uh, the self and it is uh, likely uh, that uh, it is through Frederick van Eden uh, that um, Brouwer uh, started uh, uh, becoming interested in uh, the uh, Indian uh, tradition of uh, uh, the reference to the self. Van Eden uh, was indeed uh, a uh, very passionate reader of the, of the Vedas. He, he also had a, a friend who was a Sanskritist. Uh, and uh, when uh, Van Eden uh, wrote his own song of appearance and, and essence, he, um, he uses uh, uh, a lot of the uh, traditional uh, Indian uh, imagery, but also adds uh, his own metaphors uh, ex expressing the idea of uh, the deepest self. This was also in line with uh, uh, his idea on language gradation, because uh, about these deepest things, one should speak in poetry. That was his feeling. Like the most fundamental language uh, was really the language of, of, of the poet. And I, I think Brouwer would probably have agreed with that. Now another, oops. I have. Is there anything? Okay. Um, <clears throat> I would like to uh, talk about uh, another influence uh, on uh, uh, Brouwer, uh, namely the influence of the Marburg uh, Neo Kantianism. Um, and look, we know that at Dutch universities, uh, look, uh, Neo Kantianism was uh, taught, and uh, I am now mainly thinking of um, Herman Cohen who is considered to be the founder of the Marburg uh, School, who uh, wrote uh, very fundamental uh, publications uh, regarding uh, new interpretations of Plato. Uh, and in Cohen's writings, we find, for instance, uh, thanks to a very uh, thorough philological um, research project, uh, uh, a new interpretation of uh, the word idea in Plato. And as was said before, uh, one, if one mentions Plato, one thinks of another world and there are the ideas. But um, when you read the dialogues more closely, you find out that the word idea is actually uh, used in the sense of the, the living uh, activity of, of thought. Tending, maybe, to something like ideas, but uh, every, everything is very much centered on a human being's attempt at reaching something. This we should also uh, um, relate to um, what the significants say about the use of, of language. Uh, uh, basically, there are two, they, they use more, more refined uh, uh, distinctions, but basically there's the, denotational use of the language, and there is the volitional use of, of language. And uh, grenzbegriffe, these uh, uh, concepts which are limit setting, uh, denote things which are pure, purely uh, within our reach, but at the same time they hint at something else. So there is 
uh, de denoting on the one hand and hinting uh, uh, on the other hand. And that's the volitional function of language. In the same uh, Marburg uh, school, there was uh, uh, Paul uh, Natorp, who also became uh, influential in the Netherlands. And uh, also uh, referring to um, uh, ancient uh, philosophy, he was a Plato lover as well. Uh, he said, one can only find the truth by looking through oneself. Quotes uh, Heraclitus uh, in that uh, context. 